listening to All the Books, a weekly show of recommendations and enthusiasm regarding the week's new book releases. This is episode 351, and today we are talking about books being released on March 1st, 2022, and more. I'm Liberty Hardy, here with Danica Ellis, and we're coming to you from bookriot.com. Danica, hello! Hello! How's it going? Good, how about you? All right, all right. I'm a little confused because we normally record on Fridays, but now... You had some schedule changes, so we're recording on Wednesdays now. And so, like, mm-hmm. five times today, I've been like, it's Friday, I have to do this. It's Friday, I have to do that. <laughs> like, my brain, like, the part that, that understands what's going on and the part that is driving the car are two separate parts. So, you know, like, if it was really Friday, I wouldn't do this. And this would be going on in this. And I know this, and yet I'm still like, it's Friday, it's Friday, yay! So, <laughs> I'm it's Wednesday. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, my Wednesdays and my Fridays are not very different, except that, you know, I usually record the podcast that day and I write the New Books newsletter. So, I mean, there's very little difference in any of my days. <laughs> I don't know why my brain is so excited to think that it's Friday. So, what I really want is for it to be Thursday because it's been like a week, over a week since there's been a Celtics game and I'm, I'm craving a Celtics game. So... <laughs> I'm very excited about the return of the Celtics on Thursday. What exciting things are happening in Canada? Oh, exciting things. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Mostly excitement <laughs> has not been super fun lately, so oh. <laughs> I don't know if we want to get into that. <laughs> All right, well, then we'll skip that. I guess I, I, guess I could say, uh, what exciting things are happening in the world of books while you are in Canada. (laughs) I hope you have some great things that you love to talk about today. Oh, yes. Always. All right. And you sent me a message. I'm going to, I'm going to call you out right now in front of everyone. You sent me a message that said you might be a little loopy today, which is so like, that's always me. I'm always the one who's like, you know, (laughs) um, the cat fell on my head. I have a concussion. I have a migraine. I didn't sleep for 17 days. I might be a little loopy. (laughs) And so I was like, whoa, someone else might be a little loopy. (laughs) I'm kind of excited. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I was in calls, like Zoom calls all day, uh, back to back, which I haven't really done not back to back. And I'm in a new setup. And I didn't have as much time to kind of look at my notes than I usually would. So it's gonna, it'll be a little different. <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right. Well, yeah, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. You know, that's also why we have an editor. In case you like yeah. break into song or something, you know, you're like, wait, no, <laughs> <laughs> wrong podcast. I know you have a secret song podcast. Don't deny it. <laughs> I'll try to refrain. (laughs) (laughs) So we are going to talk about books today, as usual. Uh, Before we do that, I want to remind you that you can now check out the closed caption version of all the books by visiting it on YouTube. There is a link to that in the show notes, which I will give you the link to in at the end of the show. Here's a link to a link, but not till the end. Um, Lots of links. Link, link, link. It's a fun word to say. Did anyone ever watch Lancelot Link? I think that's like, I'm a little too old for everyone else, but um, there was a show called Lancelot Link, Detective Chimp, which (laughs) is just horrible now when you think about it. They used to dress these monkeys up and make them smoke cigarettes and use roller skates. And it was was on after the monkeys, but they used to show it in reruns when I was a kid and I was very excited because monkeys. Anyway, now I'm a little loopy, getting way (laughs) off track. Uh, So we are going to hear from our first sponsor. All right, so my first pick for today is the very exciting Gallant by V.E. Schwab. You must recognize V.E. Schwab's name. Like, you know the adult fantasy series Shades of Magic. There's The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which came out, was it last year or the year before now? I don't remember. I loved it. Uh, The middle grade series City of Ghosts. Uh, Monsters of Verity YA series. V.E. Schwab has like a million amazing books And this is an exciting new YA standalone fantasy novel, complete with gorgeous illustrations and fun use of space, text, and images. I was very excited to get an actual physical copy of this so that I could see all that good stuff, and it's just lovely. It's about a young woman named Olivia Pryor. She lives at the Maryland School for Girls, which is this horrible Dickensian kind of, basically an orphanage where the matrons are mean 
and everything is gray and she's forced to work in the kitchen and people are really mean to her. She was left there as a baby. She wasn't even two years old when she was dropped at the doorstep and she doesn't remember her parents or anything about her life and no one knows anything about her. The only thing that they know about her is that when she was found, there was a journal which appeared to have been written by her mother. And in the journal, she learns that her father died. Uh, He got very sick while her mother was pregnant with her, and he died. And as she started to raise the baby, her mother became increasingly paranoid about certain things that that don't really make sense in in her writing. Like, it's obvious there's something going on that, like, no one understands. And the only thing that she actually writes to Olivia herself is that she should never go to Gallant. And then the fate of her mother is unknown. She dropped the baby off or someone dropped the baby off and no one knows like what happened to her mother. So now, you know, it's it's a dozen or so years later. She's been living in this terrible place where the girls are mean to her. Everybody's mean. She can also see ghouls. She can see these little bits of, of ghosts that are trying to make themselves known that are around the, the property where the school is. Also, Olivia is unable to speak. Uh, so she is teased for that a lot when she is when she is young and and basically right up until she receives this letter. She's called to the matron's office many years after you know she's been dropped off, and the matron tells her that there's there's a letter for her and she reads it. It's from her uncle, who says that he's been looking for her for many years, writing to every place that he can conceive of, and he invites her to come stay at his estate called Gallant. Now, the school is happy to send her away because they don't really know what to do with her. And the girls don't really like her, so they're happy to see her go. But when she arrives at this old manor estate, no one really knows why she is there. Which is very strange because she was invited there. And at the estate, there are lots of shadows and there are secrets behind every door. And it's just her and a family member and, like, two servants. And And Olivia spends a lot of time creeping around and, like, checking out things and just looking for clues as to, you know, who her family was and what she's doing there. And in the course of her investigations, she crosses this space over into a different version of Gallant. Now, this is a shadowy, crumbling version of this world that is ruled by a mysterious figure. What has Olivia discovered? And just what does it have to do with her parents and where she is from? Now, all of E. Schwab's books are just these books with beautiful imagery and language and they're very like fairy tales. This one I think is the most quiet that I've read. It's more of like a quiet melancholic story almost. There's not a lot of splashy action. It's very atmospheric and moody. It's being compared to The Secret Garden, which I've read and I totally can see that. It's also being compared to Crimson Peak, which I have not seen, so I can neither confirm nor deny. Uh, But if that helps give you an idea, um, I thought I'd throw that out there too. It's just so great. Everything B.E. Schwab does is amazing. I do want to give content warnings for ableism and ableist language, bullying, child abuse, animal death on the page, violence and murder, and death of a loved one. This is Gallant by V.E. Schwab. You know, somehow I still haven't read a V.E. Schwab book. Really? Um, Yeah, it seems like it. Shouldn't be possible at this point, but <laughs> somehow. Oh, you have so many great things to look forward to. It's true. It's on, they're on my, you know, my never-ending list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first book I want to talk about today is one I have been so excited to talk about because I read it ages ago. This is the American release. It was originally published in the UK, but it's just coming out in the US today. And it's one of the many books published since 2020 whose release date kept shifting around. So I read it back for the November 2021 show, which I remember because it's the same month I read The Reckless Kind. And both of them are YA books with asexual main characters who are putting on a play with their queer friends who have their own romance side plot. Like just by complete chance, they align in that way. They're very different in a lot of other ways, but it was interesting to read them in the same month. But then I I didn't get to talk about it until now. So this is about Georgia, who is aromantic as well as being a sex repulsed asexual, though she doesn't really know any of that yet at the beginning of the book. 
So this follows her during the beginning of college, just having graduated high school. And during her graduation party, she decides and is also convinced by her friends that this is the last chance she has to kiss the guy she's been crushing on for seven years. And this is a crush that she is selected by evaluating that this is the most objectively attractive guy here. So therefore, I guess I have a crush on him, which is such a relatably queer thing to think is the same thing. But when she tries to make her move, she is just overwhelmed by a wave of disgust. And this is the incident that kind of kickstarts her journey from feeling vaguely different from her peers to really starting to explore her identity. And while she is clueless at the outset, once she begins to learn more about aromanticism and asexuality, she veers into denial. I do want to warn, especially Aero or Ace readers, that this gets pretty heavy. Georgia has a lot of internalized hatred around being Aero and Ace. And while in denial, she begins to date her other best friend of many years, Jason, which puts their friendship in jeopardy because he has real feelings for her. Slowly, though, she begins to come to terms with her identity and realizes she doesn't have to think of it as a lack. I especially loved the role of queer community and queer role models in this story. While Georgia is aware of asexuality and aromanticism pretty early on in the book, actually meeting someone who claims those labels is very different. Even before she builds a friendship with them, the fact that she has peers who are aero or ace or both has a profound impact on her. There is nuance here, though. The queer community isn't always positive. She witnesses rejection and bigotry, even from other queer people. For me, the queer community, both online and in real life, has been both the source of some of the greatest joys and feeling of belonging that I've had, as well as a source of rejection and pain, because queer people are people, which means that queer community is also going to include tension and disagreements and even bigotry. And I think acknowledging that helps us to build better communities. While the core of the story is Georgia's understanding of her queer identity, this isn't the only thing going on. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a romance between Pip and Rooney, who is Georgia's roommate, and Pip is Georgia's best friend, and this subplot has its own drama and character development. It's also a college drama that explores how overwhelming and alienating it can be to start university. I read Radio Silence by this author before, so I knew to expect some interesting thoughts about the role of post-secondary education. And while this isn't quite as critical as Radio Silence, it doesn't shy away from the loneliness and stress of that experience. Another thing I really appreciated about the story was Georgia's revelation that her friendships are worth treating as epic romances. They're worth the same amount of time and energy that she would be expected to put into a romantic relationship, and they can be just as important. And even as someone who isn't a row or ace, I think that's such an important point. Our culture can be so focused on romantic relationships that everything else is a consolation prize, but the relationships of all kinds that we build in nurture are just as important. I really enjoyed this one, and I hope that we get more Aero and Ace rep in books soon. There have been a few mainstream publications with them since Loveless was first published in the UK, but not a lot. We could definitely use more. Also, even if you've already read the book from the UK release, you should at least look at the new cover. I think it is great. And that is Loveless by Alice Oseman. I'm glad that you talked a little bit about it because I feel like I've seen these books come out before and like there were different versions. And then I was like, wait, that's new. Mm-hmm. And then it got pushed forever. And so I was yeah. so confused. I'm like, is this really coming out or is this like just a delay or what is happening? <laughs> Yeah, I was tracking it because I had already like written up, I I was all ready to talk about it. And then suddenly it disappeared. So I've been kind of periodically checking in to be like, are are you still coming out? I don't understand. Yeah, I've been feeling very overwhelmed by release dates. And I don't think I'm the only one. Yeah, I feel like in the last few weeks that even the publicists and publishers have given up on being like, we changed the date again. (laughs) Like some some big title I was talking about last night. I was like, it comes out in June. And someone was like, no, it got moved to May. And I was like, oh, I don't even know. Like, I, I can't keep yeah. track anymore. 
Um, yeah. I just put my head down and read the books. <laughs> so my next pick for today is also a YA novel. I realized, like, I have three YA novels today, and I was going to be four, and I didn't even notice until just now. I guess that's where I was at, but I picked my favorites, and this is one of them. It's called This Golden State by Merritt Weisenberg. Uh, it is a story about a family on the run and what happens when they stop running. Poppy is a young woman who doesn't know what life is like without being on the run. She and her family have been running her whole life, never setting down in one place for very long, using different names, not getting to go to school, really, having to just take off in the middle of the night. Uh, she's not allowed to have a cell phone. She's not allowed to use a computer. She has a little sister who is a few years younger than her, who is also the same, like, not allowed to, to use technology. Uh, and, and Poppy doesn't know why she and her parents and her sister have lived this life like this. They just know that, you know, their parents seem like they only have each other and it's not safe to talk to anybody about anything. And they just keep going from one place to the next. The Winslow family only has each other. And basically, for the most part, Poppy and her sister have abided by these rules. You know, they love their parents. They love each other. But, you know, Poppy is getting older and they have to leave behind, you know, friends all the time, which is like the hardest part for her. You know, sometimes they have to leave behind their stuff. They always have to live in like a motel room. And so at the beginning of this book, they're taken, their parents take them from this motel again for like the millionth time. And this time, their parents take them to California, but things are different there. For the very first time, they're living in a whole house instead of a motel room. And even though her mother's not talking about it, Poppy gets the sense that her parents kind of know, like, about this house and this place. They've been there before. And Poppy gets really upset because she wants to take a computer course. She wants. She's very curious about computers, and she never gets to do anything. And so her family decides that... Yes, it's okay. She can take this computer course uh, at a local college for the summer. It's for high school students. Uh, it's just down the street, so she gets to walk there. She has to walk on her own. It's all very exciting. She's never been able to do any of that stuff. So when Poppy goes to this class, she meets a very handsome young man who has secrets of his own, and she starts to fall for him. And they begin spending a lot of time together, but she can't tell him anything about herself and she's very conflicted. She's tired of running. She doesn't know, like, who her parents really are, you know. And she's beginning to question everything, you know, because she's worried that this is going to be taken away from her at any moment again. And she doesn't want to do that anymore. So they get talking in class about DNA and online DNA tests. And Poppy decides, you know, she wants to know who she's really related to. Like, who are her grandparents? And without telling her parents she takes a dna test and submits it uh, so that the results she can look them up online she creates a fake account for the internet and the consequences of her actions will be so much bigger than she was expecting you know and will she ever get to be a regular kid i thought that this was a really great family on the run story uh, it has sort of like 21st century updates with the girls not being able to have cell phones or being able to use the internet, you know, and also like with the addition of like the DNA test, like what an interesting aspect, you know, like you can be traced through your DNA and like be careful what you put on the internet. It felt like a very real situation. Like I felt like I was almost reading a memoir, like a very real family in a real situation. And, you know, I felt for all of them, for everyone involved. I thought this was just an excellent, excellent book. I do want to give content warnings for stressful situations and mentions of violent crime, illness, and death. This is This Golden State by Merritt Weisenberg. That sounds super interesting. It's so good. It's funny that you picked mostly YA because that's what I usually do. And for once, I have an adult book that's not <laughs> <laughs> a graphic novel. Bizarro All the Books episode. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is a weird day. <laughs> it's Wednesdays. They're just so confused. Apparently, a, a completely different recording day. <laughs> they made their own rules, but we have books, and that's what's important. So this one is called "Tell Me an Ending" by Joe Harkin. So I said at the beginning of the year that I want to read more literary fiction this year, and this is me trying to live up to that. Tell Me an Ending is technically sci-fi. It's set in an alternative present, but it's more about the characters and like the portraits of these characters than it is about the technology. 
The premise is that there is a company called Nepenthe who has invented a memory erasure technique back in the late 90s. And there are two kinds of memory deletion. There is self-informed and self-confidential. In a self-informed deletion, you are aware that you have deleted a memory. You can't access the memory itself, but you know the general parameters and you remember getting this procedure. Whereas self-confidential, you don't know that it's happened. You're taken to the clinic in the night, returned to your bed. You agreed to this beforehand, but afterwards... You have no idea, not only that the memory ever happened, but that you ever had your memory altered in any way. And the self-informed deletions seem to be mostly well-received, while some patients are convinced that it has affected their memory as a whole. They're pretty easily reassured because memory is plastic. You probably never had that really great a memory as you like to think you did. It's normal not to be able to access your sixth grade teacher's name or something. But Lately, there has been a murmuring about real issues with the self-confidential cases, at least from a small percentage of clients. A lawsuit has been filed that claims these memories weren't completely erased, as promised, and that people are having traces of memories, which is disturbing because they can't access the root memory. They don't know for sure that they've had it removed, but they're just starting to get these little hints of things that they can't remember happening, and they don't know why they keep remembering something that they don't remember in full. And eventually, Nepenthe agrees to contact self-confidential clients with the information that they've had this procedure done, as well as the option to have the memory restored, though they don't tell you what the memory was. And as you can imagine, this wreaks havoc on people's lives. Without warning, people who have been happily living without a traumatic memory have been given this option. Do you restore what your past self decided wasn't something you could live with? Or do you decide against it, but you'll always kind of wonder what was missing? Did you do something terrible and unforgivable? Were you the victim of something horrific? So this follows five main characters who have all been affected by this procedure in different ways. There's Noor, who is a psychologist at the clinic who idolizes her boss, Louise, but is beginning to suspect her and maybe the whole company of doing more harm than good. At the same time, she's haunted by the memory of a relationship she had with a former client that started after their sessions ended, and she is considering having her memories of that woman deleted. Then there's May, who is a young woman getting memory traces, who is trying to use them as a kind of scavenger hunt to rediscover what she's forgotten. So she imagines this row of houses, and she's trying to find those particular houses to see if being there will trigger more of those memories. She has been struggling to cope and hopes that Getting these memories back, starting to understand what could have happened to her, will cut through the numbness that she has been living with. Then there's Finn, who has a picture-perfect relationship with his wife, Mirand, until she gets an email that she had a memory deleted. And their marriage, and even his relationship with his daughter, is threatened by everything he imagines she could have done and not wanted to remember. That really gets in his head, and he just is constantly thinking about what this memory could have been. And then another character is Oscar, who has very few memories at all, but he knows that he's on the run, and he has been for years. He has a lot of money in his bank account and no idea how he got it. He is running from country to country, followed by seemingly powerful people who want to talk to him. And he is so afraid of what happens and what they could be tracking him down for that he is just constantly hiding. All he really remembers is stealing a gun as a teen, but he has no idea what happened next. And then finally, there is William, who is an ex-police officer who wants to have a memory erased. He has been haunted by a photo he was shown of a child's death. 
And while he is seen worse at his job, he developed PTSD after this experience and left his position. And now he and his wife are in couples counseling and his lack of communication has driven them apart. She really thinks that they need to talk about it more and that he needs to go to therapy to work through it, whereas he really feels that erasing this memory is the only way forward. So this is a fascinating read about memory, identity, mental health. It doesn't have any easy answers. Nepenthe does good and harm. It's a tool. There are people who are far better off because they had their memories altered, and there are people who really suffer because of it. They are profit-seeking above all else. All of the characters are flawed. Their motives all make sense, even when they're hurting people. And if you're curious, yes, they do discuss Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. As you can imagine, a book about the kind of memories that you'd want to delete includes some traumatic scenes, so content warnings for gore, death, child death and injury, drug abuse, both illegal and prescription, as well as going off prescription medication without supervision, and suicide. And that is Tell Me an Ending by Joe Harkin. All right. I was going to read that one, but then you marked it down. So I was like, I'm going to listen to what Danica <laughs> has to say about it and find something else to read. That's it's what's good. so exciting about this show. <laughs> I did an interview a few weeks ago and someone was asking me, like, you know, how do you do you and the other hosts like decide what you're going to read? And I'm like, I'm mostly just a pushover. Like we don't <laughs> we don't usually like say like, hey, can I do this instead of you? You know, and and you know, I'm always like, there's very few things that I I want to talk about myself. Like there are very few books mm. that I would be like, if you try to talk about that, I will cut you. So <laughs> yeah, we're just we just get along. Plus we all have such different tastes, you know. So it's true. It's pretty yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah. So back to my amazing YA day. Uh, my next pick is A Thousand Steps Into Night by Tracy Chi. Tracy Chi is the author of We Are Not Free, which was nominated for roughly a zillion awards when it came out, including being a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, it is this amazing, powerful novel about the internment camps during World War II. This A Thousand Steps Into Night is a Japanese-inspired fantasy novel that everyone is going to love because it's so amazing. It is set in the world of Awara, where gods, monsters, and humans all exist side by side. Miyoko is the innkeeper's daughter. She leads what she thinks is kind of a boring life and not a really great life. Miyoko is looked on with derision and dislike because she's clumsy and she is loud in a world where girls should be subservient and seen but not heard. So she's kind of, like, really unhappy with her existence. Uh, and, you know, then we find out, be careful what you wish for, because Miyoko is cursed by a demon and begins to transform into a demon herself, and her touch becomes deadly. And she's freaking out, as you would. You know, like, this is what is happening to her. You know, she's worried for her soul. She doesn't know what she's going to do. So she decides, you know, she's going to go on... This trip to find a cure for this curse and reverse the symptoms because this is not what she wants for herself. But as she, you know, sets off on her quest, her, first of all, her travels are full of danger and adventure, like nonstop. Uh, she's chased by demon hunters. She acquires a magpie spirit as her sidekick, who I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, it, people, she has to outwit tricksters and devils. Uh, and as she travels and she's working really hard to exist in this world where, you know, first she's treated poorly because she's a girl and now she's treated poorly because she's a demon, she realizes that this new form, you know, as lethal as it may be to other people, uh, offers her freedoms that she never had before growing up a girl in an oppressive patriarchal society. And maybe she doesn't want to go back to how she was because she's got some pretty cool stuff going on, you know, the whole you know, death demon thing aside. This book is remarkably fast-paced, full of adventure from beginning to end. It gets a little dark sometimes, but it is always fabulous. And there's so much going on in it. You know, there isn't just one villain or just one danger, you know. There's a lot of things that are, are scary and a lot of things that could hurt her, just like the real world. And Geki is her thieving magpie spirit, who is an absolute delight. 
he's kind of like the bird in the Lion King. He's got his own agendas. He's got a lot of quips to say to Miyoko. He steals everything that he can get his little claws on. He because he, he's a magpie, so you know, ooh, shiny. He's just he's the best little sidekick. And I just I loved Miyoko's journey. And and honestly, I didn't know if I wanted her to turn back. You know, like you're gonna find out what she chooses. But I also really like that. In this book, instead of having a glossary in the front or back, uh, there are just footnotes on the pages where there are words that the author feels need defining or pronunciation. So instead of having to like search through the book to find out like, what does this mean or what does that mean? It's right there for you at the bottom of the book. Someone on Goodreads called this Spirited Away on steroids. I've never seen Spirited Away, which I know is is a flaw in myself, but um, I thought I would throw that out there because it might mean something to a lot of other people because I know it is a beloved film. Um, I, I just think it's excellent. I want to give content warnings for misogyny, attempted sexual assault, violence, and murder. This is A Thousand Steps Into Night by Tracy Chi. And now we are going to hear from our next sponsor. Okay. Danica, you're up. Yes, I think we have uh, our last YA pick here, <laughs> and it's really good. It's really good. It's Ready When You Are by Gary Lonesborough, and this is also an American release, but this one was first published in Australia as The Boy from the Mish, and my only complaint about this book is that I think the original cover is much better, so please check that out, too. It's really cute. So this is about Jackson, who is an Australian Aboriginal teen living on the Mish, which is an Aboriginal community. He is feeling a little aimless right now. He's just decided that he is not going back to high school after the break. He's got a girlfriend that he likes, but he can't seem to connect with on a romantic or sexual level. And he spends most of his time hanging out, drinking with his friends. During the Christmas holidays, his auntie and cousins come over to visit, packing the house with excited kids. This time, though, Auntie Pam has brought an unrelated guest named Thomas. Thomas is Jackson's age, also Aboriginal, and he has just gotten out of juvie, and Auntie Pam has taken him under her wing. He'll be sleeping on the floor of Jackson's room, which Jackson is not impressed with, even if he is cute. And as you have probably guessed, this is a love story between them. And it's also Jackson's slow coming to terms with being gay. It's getting a lot of comparisons to Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe, which I think is warranted. While the writing styles are different, they are both atmospheric, introspective reads about young men struggling to accept their identities, partly because being gay doesn't match the image they have of the masculinity that they want to perform. Jackson and his friends face racism from the police and white classmates on a regular basis, but while on the mish, Jackson's friends make homophobic jokes and make fun of the one out classmate at their school. Despite it being very evident that he is not attracted to women and he is attracted to men, Jackson feels like he can't be gay on the mish. And even when Jackson and Thomas kiss, he tries to convince himself that it's a fluke and it doesn't mean anything. Despite that, he can't deny the relationship building between them, as evidenced by the graphic novel that they are co-creating as part of Thomas's rehabilitation, and it's about a superhero from the Mish. While Jackson has a lot of internalized homophobia, and that is tangled up in his identity as an Aboriginal man, I loved the depiction of the cultural pride and positive masculinity in his community outside of just his friends group. The men of the Mish meet regularly to paint together and to help each other, and it's a really touching depiction of positive masculinity. He is able to get guidance from a male elder who helps him feel better about all the parts of who he is, and he also gets a lot of unconditional love and support from his mom. I couldn't help while reading this to think about the wave of book banning that is rolling over the U.S., especially in school libraries, because this is a book that I could really easily see targeted. It's by a Black Aboriginal author with Black Aboriginal main characters, has a gay love story, there are sex scenes, there's drinking and drug use, and the main character considers dropping out of school. If it escapes the list circulating between far-right groups, I will be shocked. 
But this is the kind of book that can be formative, that is life-changing for some people. There are so few books about Indigenous queer people, especially to Indigenous queer people in love. Jackson exactly demonstrates how a lack of representation can lead to feelings of shame, fear, even suicidal thoughts. And hiding those realities doesn't mean that these teens will no longer have sex, drink, do drugs, or be queer. It just makes it more dangerous to do a lot of those things and makes teens less likely to reach out for support when they need it. I apologize for the soapbox, but I've been doing a lot of reading about censorship, especially of queer and Black books. And I think this book is well worth reading outside of being important and underrepresented, but it is those things too. I hope to see this in schools and public libraries across the country so it can reach the hands of teens who need it. I want to give content warnings for racism, homophobia, slurs, and suicide ideation. And that is Ready When You Are by Gary Lonesborough. Okay. So my last pick was originally going to be All My Rage by Saba Tahir. Then I found out last night that uh, it is a sponsor of the show, so I could not use it for a pick, but that tells you a lot. I do love it. Also, in my never-ending slideshow of horrors that runs in the back of my brain of uh, public humiliations, uh, Saba Tahir comes up quite often because for some reason, when I met her at Neba several years ago, she was there for like her second or third book. And I don't know if you follow her on social media, but she's so cool and so funny and I just admire her so much. And so when I met her, she like signed my book for me. And I don't know why, but I curtsied and then was like, why did I curtsy and like walked off? And so I'm sure she doesn't even remember. But in my head, I'm like, hey, remember that time you curtsied at Sabbath here like a dummy? So every time I talk about her, like my face gets really red. So and now I'm telling all of you just because I love to share my public embarrassments, I guess. Uh, But moving on, I have a book that I started reading, and it's called Another Appalachia, Coming Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place by Nima Avashia. And so far, so good. It's kind of a collection of essays, and it's exactly as the title says. She talks about growing up a queer Asian American in West Virginia. The first two essays I have read are about her father who worked for a chemical plant and how he chose... Uh, his family and providing for them over coming out and talking about the dangers of chemicals uh, and and the racism that was involved uh, in, in being the only Indian person in like this plant where everyone else was white. And when there was an accident with the, co- the company in India, they sent him as the face. And it's all very fascinating. And I, I look forward to finishing it. I wish, you know, I'd had more time to get to it before the show, but Certainly, I'll be happy to tell anybody my thoughts and feelings about it after I'm finished. It just is so great so far. Um, I wanted to mention it. And that is Another Appalachia Coming Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place by Nima Avashia. Okay, my last pick is a graphic novel. It's Chef's Kiss by Jarrett Melendez, Danica Bryan, and others. This follows a... I know. I am always. It definitely helps when there's a Dan. <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. List. Yeah, because it's not a very common name, so no. I definitely give preferential treatment to Dan. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. All right, sorry to interrupt. I got very excited. <laughs> <laughs> So this is about a group of friends who are moving in together after graduating university. Uh, It's mostly about Ben, who is an English major who is going through a ton of interviews and being rejected over and over because they all want experience for their entry level positions, which is very relatable. But then he sees a no experience required sign as an assistant cook when he was about to give up and move back home. He figures this is a chance he can make a little bit of money while he keeps looking for editing and writing work. So he applies there and it turns out to be a very 
weird, non-traditional <laughs> interview process because the boss is very controlling. He's kind of a weirdo. And he insists that all recipes are approved by his pet pig. This is mostly a realistic book, except for this just genius level taste tester pig who does increasingly weird things when he approves of a recipe, like meditating and going into a different state. So in order to get the job, he is hired on a trial basis, and he has to pass the boss's tests each week, which culminates in seeing if this pig will eat his recipes. Unsurprisingly, given the elevated status of this pig, this is a vegetarian restaurant. So he goes for it, even though the boss is not only a weirdo, but also controlling and insulting and yells and swears at him in front of his co-workers. And there is even more public humiliation in this book later. So if you are sensitive to secondhand embarrassment, be aware of that. And one of the things that I found so funny about this book is that it turns out that Ben has gone into being an English major and seeking out writing and editing experience because it's always sort of been assumed that's what he would do. And he has been pressured into it by his parents, even though it is a passion of his. And as an English major, the idea of your your parents pressuring you to be an English major as if it's a solid career choice is very funny to me because I feel like, you know, starting at a restaurant is probably an easier path to a successful career. I, they're both hard, but I just found the the picture of his parents being so disappointed that he's not going into writing because it's that's the responsible choice that he should make. Very funny. But this is a romance. He is immediately crushing on the sous chef at this restaurant, and they're working together, but he is too shy to actually act on this and ask him out. So it's a lot of just flirting and blushing and him trying to work up the nerve to actually do anything about it. The other roommates are mostly background characters, but they do get a little bit of their own moments, which is fun. And it does have like a little bit of that fantasy element because the pig, you know, when he approves of a recipe, he'll give him roses, but then the rest of the time it's just a pig. And he kind of hears his roommate commenting on what he's doing and the bad decisions he's making in the form of her showing up as like a little little fairy godmother, I guess, on her side. So this is a mostly lighthearted, fun romance, but again, just be aware of the secondhand embarrassment factor. And it's always nice to read a story like this where it's completely a non-issue that he's gay, he's already out, everybody knows about it, nobody cares. Uh, So that's always fun in a queer romance when that doesn't have to be an issue that is tackled. And that is Chef's Kiss by Jarrett Melendez, Danica Bryan, and others. All right, I just wanted you to know that because I already interrupted once to say something about Danica. I didn't interrupt you again, but I really wanted to make a whole hog joke. <laughs> uh, that sounds great. I have that. I did not know about the pig aspect. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like fabulism, but just just with a pig. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I have a pig with a discerning palate. I thought everybody did. Yeah, I'm so jealous. <laughs> So those are our new books. What are you going to read next? Yeah, I'm going to finish Sisters of the Forsaken Stars, <gasps> which is the sequel to Our Lady of Endless Worlds by Lena Rather, which is a group of nuns in space on a living spaceship and kind of government conspiracies and the wars between planet systems. Uh, It's got a philosophical bed to it. It's very interesting so far. You gasped. Have you read the first one? I did. Nuns in space. Yes, yes, I did. (laughs) I liked it very much. I haven't read the second one yet, though. Yeah, it's very interesting. I really need to get on that. 
So I am going to read Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black. Uh, my friend Christine, who does the events for Loyalty Bookstore, was telling me last night that it's the best book she's read this year. Uh, it's about a black father who makes amends with his gay son through letters written on his deathbed. It sounds devastating. But yeah. she sold me on it. She said it's worth reading, even though it is going to break my heart and make me cry like a million days in a row. So I'm all for it. You know, what's what's another million days in a row, really, <laughs> at this point? So it sounds amazing. She's she's saying like award awards are going to be given to this book. So I can't wait to mm. read it. And that is it for us this week. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our awesome audio editor, Jen Zink. You can drop us a line at all the books at bookriot.com. You can find us online. Danica hangs out on Twitter at Lesbrary. I mostly hang out on Instagram at Friends and Comes Alive. And if you want to give us a treat, you can go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave a rating or review. It helps other book lovers to find us. And as much as we would love to tell you about more books today, we just don't have the time, but you can read about more titles out now in the show notes at bookriot.com slash all the books, as well as find the link to our weekly new books newsletter and the link to the closed caption version on YouTube. And for more recs or general bookishness, check out bookriot.com. And don't forget to check out our full stable of podcasts at bookriot.com slash listen, or just search Book Riot on your podcast player of choice. And in the meantime, happy, happy reading. reading.